Thank you. Thank you so much um, to everyone for coming and thank you for the wonderful invitation. Um, I really enjoyed thinking about the intersections between the work on speculative methods and pedagogies that I've been doing and what I understand to be the kind of um, priorities and goals that CalRG shares. And the second half of the talk, I'm going to focus particularly on issues that I hope will be interesting to everybody here um, and give some examples of some speculative work that may resonate with you um, in terms of your thinking about your own research and practice. So that's going to be the second half. And um, the first half will be a sort of attempt, I guess, to set out not only what I think speculative methods and pedagogies are about, but also why it's worthwhile and important to try to research and work in this way. Um, so um, this is the book that really um, is the culmination of about 10 years of research and teaching um, based here at the University of Edinburgh in the Centre for Research in Digital Education. Um, the the book itself um, is, I guess, I described it to someone the other day as a kind of a methods book. Um, it's, a, it's a research methods book, it's a teaching methods book, um, and it uses some projects as case studies from um, across a range of topics that uh, have been the focus of research for me and teaching for me and my colleagues um, in the last decade or so. So the book is in three kind of parts and I guess um, what I'd like to start with is giving some of that overview, um, which is the first part of the book, and then we'll get into some specific uh, examples and contexts, and then hopefully have an interesting discussion about what that may mean for um, the computers and learning research that I know everyone here is involved in. So some questions that I think are um, important to inform the way we think about doing research and teaching about digital education and digital learning futures. Um, the first one is, how do digital futures for learning come to be imagined and acted upon in the first place? Um, how is it that some ideas of what the future may hold uh, come to have a lot of currency um, and a lot of weight, while others perhaps don't? Um, how can they be imagined otherwise? And this may be important not only for um, the more dystopian kinds of futures for learning that we're sometimes um, faced with or presented with, but for all kinds of futures for learning, it is important for us to stop and ask how they came to be and how they might be otherwise so that we can keep that idea of the future kind of open and moving. Um, and this matters, I think, because the way that we as researchers and educators and students um, believe in the futures for our field and for the work that we do really shapes not only um, our ideas about what we should be doing, you know, a few years from now, but also really shapes what we're what we're doing now, uh, what we prioritize, what we remember about the past, um, and what we care about. And so, if the digital futures for learning that we're working with are not meeting our needs in particular kinds of ways, then we can think differently about those futures and that can actually be impactful. In answer to that first question about how it is that futures come to be uh, imagined, the first kind of key idea here for me is around the imaginary. Um, and this is a concept that has emerged from um, sociology primarily, uh, but there's also been a lot of work that's been done around um, education in the concept, context of the imaginary. And this is about what society and people and schools and school people are like and how things fit together and what norms and images underlie expectations. So these are not always um, absolutely uh, they're not always absolutely explicit, but these are the sorts of ideas about what is going on under the bonnet, as it were, of our society, of our educational systems and what people expect um, and why. And in recent years, there's been um, some work around socio-technical imaginaries. So um, Sheila Jasanoff is a key person who's talked about those. Um, and the way she frames those is about how advances in science and technology will produce desirable futures. Um, and ed tech imaginaries have come into the kind of dialogue in the last couple of years as well. Audrey Waters was one of the first people to coin this idea um, about how 
particular sort of utopian views, or some some people might call them utopian views of, edu of, of educational technology and technology in general, shape our expectations about the future. Um, and these imaginaries are kind of everywhere when you start to notice them um, and are quite influential and important in how we think about the future. Um, a second way that futures of learning come into being are through um, what uh, what uh, Pollock and Williams call promissory organizations, or also through the predictions that are made by um, the use of data-driven processes, data-driven decision-making. So this category is kind of around predictions and how those predictions happen. Um, Pollock and Williams is really interesting work. They're discussing Gartner in particular, and they're talking about intermediaries that actually specialize in predictions. Their work is about trying to enable confidence and investment in particular kinds of innovations and technologies, as well as the direction of technological expectation and decision making that other organizations may make on the basis of these predictions. Um, really interestingly, a whole bunch of stuff happens under the banner of data driven processes or data driven decision making. And these are about probabilistic predictions um, that are driving understanding of what's possible in educational settings, uh, not only for individuals, uh, but also collectively for um, the education system. And Ben Williamson, my wonderful colleague in the Center for Research in Digital Education, has done a lot of work around the way that digital futures are told through um, the lens of data driven prediction. Um, and, the, and the way this works is that large scale datification of learning, teaching and assessment makes learning futures appear calculable. Um, and a lot of this predictive work is about trying to um, minimize risk so that we can um, plan for futures that are going to go more or less the way we expect them to. Um, and finally, there's a whole body of literature and theory around anticipation. Um, and the distinction here is around behaviors that use the future in their decision processes. So Poli is one of the key people who writes about anticipation and anticipatory um, decision making. And it, it's about two things. One is about this kind of forward looking attitude. And the second is about how you use that forward looking attitude and the results of it for action. Um, so, for example, Kanzansky talk about the way anticipation um, helps technologists and educators and communities that are targeted with digital surveillance engage with sense making in a future oriented mode to try to manage uncertainty. Um, anticipatory knowledge practices, though, do tend to reduce social complexity and therefore the openness of the future. And uh, uh, Sarah Amsler and Carrie Facer wrote a wonderful paper called about anticipatory regimes in education that are all about trying to eliminate possible future risks. And they argue that this is at the expense of what they call collective action and forward dreaming. Um, and so that idea about collective action and forward dreaming is, I guess, where speculative methods come in. Um, so there's a lot of um, really interesting work going on under the banner of critical education futures. Um, and Milojevic back in 2005 framed this in a way that I thought I think is really helpful. So she talks about critical education futures as being about trying to unmask uh, the allegedly realistic nature of futures. Um, also about how to discuss alternatives on an equal footing to those realistic futures and to try to recognize the ways that our present is really the result of the many utopian and dystopian visions of the past. Um, and that's what I mean when I say the work, the futures work that we do now um, has an impact not only on the present, but also on the future and how that future will come to be understood. Um, so this is this is the sort of foundation and the and the reason for trying to work in speculative ways um, in digital education and digital learning research. So what are we talking about when we talk about speculative methods and pedagogies? Um, my definition of this, whoops, what did I do? My definition of this is um, that a speculative approach works with the future as a space of uncertainty and uses that uncertainty creatively in the present. Um, and this means that speculative approaches engage with emergence and complexity in education and educational technology futures um, in ways that actually sort of partly create those issues while it's exploring them. 
Um, and when we come to talk about the teacher bot project, which I'm going to talk about in a little while, um, I'll say more about how I think that happens and, and what it does. Um, speculative approaches also value playful and imaginative and glitchy and strange encounters, but at the same time are responsible to the future and to those people and objects and practices that are enrolled in its arrangements. Um, and this is a really complicated tension between being playful, being imaginative, um, working with glitches, and also trying to take responsibility to the future itself and also it to the people and the things that are involved in working with futures now. Um, and in the book, I suggest that there's some key messages that we can think about when we're trying to work with speculative methods and approaches. Um, and those are around temporality and time, around creativity and around the kinds of realities that are actually produced through speculative approaches. Um, so first of all, uh, I think it's probably been, become apparent already, um, the sort of the way that we think about and work with futures is also equally about the past and the present. And this interplay of past, present and future produces speculative approaches. Um, this can help us really situate and ground our work, um, not necessarily in sort of reality or fact, but in responsibility. Uh, attention to where questions and visions of the future come from and how they could be situated can help us sort of break these problematic loops that we often see in digital education, in ed tech, where um, predicted futures are endlessly kind of um, deferred and reconfigured. I mean, there's so many examples where something was going to happen, it didn't really happen, and then people just kind of forgot about it, right? And I think when we work speculatively, we can um, re-engage with and recover some of those previous futures and work with them in new kinds of ways, um, which I find really interesting. Uh, and finally, um, Speculative questions and objects and engagements need time and space for interruptions and surprises. We'll talk more about what that looks like. Um, this sort of idea is that we need some sensitivity to how strange it is to work with the future um, in a research or a teaching context. And this strangeness really can slow things down. Um, it might require a fresh start or it may trip us into the unexpected. I like the way that um, Springe and Truman talk about what they frame as speculative middles in research. They talk about the way uh, a speculative what if emerges as a catalyst for a research event. Um, and they say that the middle is a difficult place to be. It's hard to see things clearly in the middle. And that's the point. The middle can't be known in advance of research. You have to be in it and situated and responsive. You're not there to report on what you find or what you seek, but to activate thought and to agitate it. And so they say that the speculative middle shifts methods from reporting on the world to a way of being in the world that's open to experimentation and is intention. Um, and there's absolutely tons to unpack there. And if people want to talk about this more, we absolutely can. But I think this relationship to time and the future and knowledge is very important in thinking about how you would actually design and um, undertake a speculative project. The second key idea or key message here is that the futures that are made by speculative approaches are creative and imaginative. They're not descriptive or instrumental depictions of the future of education and learning. They're not predictions in the same way that we see in other forms of kind of futures work or future making. Um, they're kind of knowing and they're kind of explicit about their inventiveness, um, but that doesn't make them not real. Um, and that's what I'll come on to talk about in a minute. It's just they're they're sort of different. Um, and I think also really importantly, um, there's a lot of talk, especially at the moment, about the need for hope in education and education futures. And I absolutely agree with that. But I also think that we see a lot of really interesting dystopian work that happens when people start to work speculatively with education futures. Um, and I would argue quite strongly, actually, that um, if we're articulating or designing speculatively from ambiguity, loss or anger, this is also a form of care and it can be quite important. Um, so I, um, I am really interested in the relationship between um, anger and hope, for example, or loss and hope. Um, and that's something that I would like to do more work on um, in the future. Um, and finally, although speculative approaches might um, engage with predictions, probabilities or trends, they're 
going to be engaging with them in a kind of non-aligned, messy or glitchy kind of way. Um, this isn't about trying to produce um, realistic futures, but about trying to engage with future in, in the moment in a creative way. And finally, um, those realities that speculative approaches create, they're inventive and they're inventive, but it doesn't mean they don't have consequences. Um, and the way that imaginaries, including new ones that we put into play, shape educational policy practice, investment and theory um, is quite, quite notable. Um, and so a story or an object or an experience that's speculative or done in a speculative way can add weight to already established or emerging futures or produce a future that hadn't really been thought of yet. Um, and I think we can look to a lot of the science fiction literature, for example, to see examples of the way that um, speculative work can uh, add weight or produce new futures in ways that is co are complicated, right? But they do it's not unimportant what happens in those kinds of speculative spaces. Um, but <laughs> working with participants or audiences to perform particular futures does things, it definitely does things, but not always the things that were anticipated. So there's kind of a riskiness to doing speculative work. I mean, arguably there's a riskiness to doing all kinds of research um, and, and to engaging in teaching um, where the outcomes are not necessarily um, completely set in stone. And it may be that futures are set into motion that weren't what anyone, including the teacher or the researcher, um, intended. So there have been actually, so when I first started writing about speculative methods uh, about 2015 or so, there really wasn't a lot going on in the educational literature that was framing its work in that particular kind of way. But um, actually now at the point of writing the book and since then, there have been a lot more examples and really interesting examples. Um, and in the educational research, we see researchers grappling with speculative questions. Um, they produce objects to think with, or they find objects to think with. Uh, they engage with particular kinds of audiences in speculative ways, and they engage with speculative forms of analysis. Um, and those methods can involve researcher made objects, uh, design activities for participants, speculative analysis and storytelling. Um, in teaching, the considerations are not dissimilar, but they tend to focus more around course design and learning objectives, um, about how you teach futures reactively and relationally rather than um, in a predictive way, and about accountability to learners and an assessment, and also in sort of lifelong learning contexts particularly, um, focuses on hybridity and co-creation. Um, and across both research and teaching, we can ask, whose futures are we talking about here and whose future presence are in play? And um, so that was a lot of um, background and kind of the underpinning ideas around speculative approaches, speculative methods. But what I'd like to do for the next 15, 20 minutes is just talk through a few examples of what this might look like in practice. Um, my first example I'm going to talk about for a little while, um, and it's one of the case studies that is in the second part of the book. It's about a project from um, 2013. Um, Tim will know all about this, uh, and it'll be interesting to talk about this later, Tim. Um, this is about uh, a project that was called the TeacherBot project. I think it actually had a fancier name at one point. It was about automated, automating the teacher, but it always was called TeacherBot by all of us. Um, and this project was, it happened at a particular time, right? In the early 2010s, there was a lot going on around um, scaled up and on demand teaching and what that was going to look like and how it was going to change higher education. Uh, but at the same time, there were really complex technical and pedagogical challenges that were associated with automating teaching. Um, and, and also the sort of issues around feedback and assessment that really had not yet been solved. Um, and the implications of reshaping education to fit the capabilities of automated systems had really not yet been understood, arguably are still not understood, but this was at a time when we were seeing a lot of futures being put into play that were about scale and about on demand. Um, and that coincided with the emergence of massive open online courses or MOOCs. Um, and this project was an attempt to grapple with 
automation and MOOCs um, in a speculative way. Uh, the project was led by my wonderful colleague, Professor Shan Bain, um, and it involved all of the teachers who were um, leading the MOOC that was called e-learning and digital cultures. Um, and it also involved colleagues from information services and from um, design informatics. What we were facing at that time in that kind of 2012, 2013, 2014 period was um, a set of visions around the future that were assuming both increasing and potentially limitless demand for higher education, but also increasing limited resources. And the argument was that this was going to require, first of all, some form of unbundling or um, deconstruction of the university and its, its services and systems. Um, and secondly, the development of automated support for or possible replacement of human teachers. Um, this might have, have looked a couple of different ways. For example, the human teacher might be freed up to focus on personal uh, expert or complex tasks and interactions with students while more routine or administrative tasks are automated. Or teachers may focus on delivering content while automated intelligent systems deal with ensuring students receive this content in suitable ways and testing attainment. Um, but few accounts of that time were exploring what this would mean for the relationships between teachers and students and between human and non-human educators. So the role of the teacher in supporting or guiding automated systems was not being discussed um, in the context of how this might unfold. So the e-learning and digital cultures MOOC or EDC MOOC was, as it was called, uh, ran, it was one of the first six MOOCs to run at the University of Edinburgh and one of the earliest MOOCs to run in the UK on the platform, which was at that time um, the most uh, well-known, um, which was Coursera. Um, Coursera was particularly known for attracting really large numbers of enrollments to these early MOOCs. Um, so for the first iteration of our EDC MOOC course, we had 51,000 people signed up um, with people joining throughout the whole of the five weeks of the course. Uh, we had 21,000 people who were active at some point during the MOOC and 4,500 still active in the final week, which sort of follows the trajectory that is typical of MOOCs where you get a lot of people and then um, participation drops off. But if you think about it, 44,500 people is still a lot of people to be dealing with, um, especially because the design of this MOOC was that um, it was going to work both within and beyond the Coursera platform. So the discussion forum within Coursera had a lot of things going on with um, over 8,000 posts and four, uh, of almost 5,000 comments. But also we were working in Twitter, uh, we were working in Facebook, and we were encouraging students to um, create personal blogs. And as you can imagine and see, this was producing an absolutely huge amount of content for participants to potentially engage with and for teachers to engage with. Um, we had really positive reports about the overall experience of the MOOC. Um, but and also we could see from the artifacts and materials that students were participants were creating that they were really engaging with the themes and with the course. But a lot of participants, some participants, many participants found the MOOC um, and the quantity of interactions quite overwhelming. And they also wanted more teacher presence in the MOOC. And that was interesting because we thought we were there, but we weren't there in the way that MOOCs were typically um, foregrounding the teacher. We weren't producing sort of talking head videos, but we were in the discussion. Um, but it wasn't visible. It was it was very interesting. So with the support of some um, innovation funding from the University of Edinburgh, we put together a project uh, that we called TeacherBot, which was um, uh, an automated, semi-automated uh, Twitter bot that would participate in the MOOC, the third instance of the MOOC. Um, and any tags, uh, any tweets that used the tag hashtag EDC MOOC were fair game for the spot to uh, scan for keywords and produce responses that had been pre-written by the teaching team. Um, and it was uh, a fascinating experience actually putting the project together, working with colleagues who were designing the back end um, and also writing the rules um, that the teacher bot would use um, when it was tweeting. And we absolutely did not keep this a secret from the participants in the MOOC. In fact, because of the topic of the MOOC and what we were trying to do, we made a bit of a, um, a feature of, of it and talked to the participants about it and asked them to 
um, see if they could notice the, the teacher bot in action and give some feedback on what it was doing and how. This is just a screenshot that shows what it looked like the back end um, the user interface where we were writing these rules. So this is one that I wrote about a, a short film that the participants watched called Bendito Machine. And you can see that um, if you can see you see this, the uh, yeah, keywords are written here that if there were a combination of um, Bendito technology, idolize, worship, cult religion that the EDC MOOC, the teacher bot, would tweet one of a few different possible responses. Um, this was all going very well. Uh, we had the plan, we had the rules, we had the test set up, we tested it. Um, and then we thought we knew what was going to happen. Um, we really wanted to work with ways of theorizing and practicing digital education and automated teaching that wasn't really about um, efficiency. It wasn't really about uh, opposition to appropriation of digital technology. It was about trying to think about how human and non-human teachers might form some kind of teaching assemblage or partnership, as Shan put it. And it did do some of that, and we'll talk about that in a second. But before it did that, um, it made quite a remarkable entrance. So uh, a couple of years ago, I started talking about this particular aspect of the TeacherBot project more. I hadn't really talked about it. And then I started to get really interested in the idea of glitches and glitches as sort of speculative um, interruptions. And I wrote a paper with a colleague, Sean Bowden, where we talked about glitches as sort of generative problems uh, that were capable of introducing unanticipated possibilities into a situation. So we talked about glitches as socio-material encounters rather than merely technical errors. Uh, and the particular glitch that uh, inaugurated the teacher bot in our EDC MOOC course was that when we turned the teacher bot on, um, the account went live and it began to participate in the hashtag EDC MOOC course, uh, part of the course. Uh, a glitch in the code, which we never did quite get to the bottom of, triggered the bot to respond to itself over and over and over again. Um, it didn't just say anything either. It said this. It said, post-human does not really mean the end of humanity. It signals the end of a certain conception of the human, which I think you'll agree is a little bit menacing, um, especially when you see it uh, a lot, like hundreds and hundreds of times in a very short period of time. Um, you can see one person put, um, responded to say, I'm guessing you really want to tweet this. It seems to be on a tweeting loop. Um, people were had a bunch of reactions to what the what the Twitter bot did um, when we first turned it on. Um, people were startled. They were amused largely um, and sometimes annoyed. But it was actually a really significant glitch in the context of a new aspect of this course that, and, and capabilities that weren't yet known. Um, you can see in this pie chart that the EDC MOOC Twitter bot absolutely dwarfed uh, the, everyone else's participation in the um, Twitter chat on this course. And the majority of those were in that first few minutes when it uh, went a little bit awry. So EDC MOOC was responsible for 1,487 of the tweets that were used the hashtag during the MOOC period. Uh, the next most prolific tweeter was my colleague, Jeremy Knox, one of the MOOC teachers who um, tweeted 132 times. Um, so yeah, it was significant what happened. Um, and on reflection, it did something quite remarkable. When I was saying earlier about the way that the MOOC teachers were not very visible um, in the first instance of the MOOC for some people and they wanted more teacher presence. Um, you really could not say that this Twitter bot was not uh, visible. It was there. Um, it was attracting attention in a very dramatic way. Um, and as, as Sean and I said, um, Sean Bowden, not Sean Bain, um, the, the pedagogical and communicative possibilities that became apparent were around how um, the expectations of what a teacher does might be incorrect, the needs of participants in a massive course to be shown, where to look might be filled in unanticipated ways, um, anxiety might be tempered by a bit of comic relief. It all became a little bit less certain what was going to happen. Um, and so the teacher bot's glitch signaled the end of a certain kind of conception of the educational encounter, we argued. 
so we fixed this glitch um, we didn't leave it doing that for um, very long and that was fine um, and then the teacher bot continued to participate and do other things in the context of the MOOC some very very interesting things um, for example uh, a really good paper by both Kilgore and Crossland in 2018 identified through social network analysis that the teacher bot was a really important entity um, that was able to change and shape the network structure in this Twitter um, side of the course. So they were looking for evidence that the teacher bot was engaged, either engaging in direct instruction, um, organizing or facilitating discourse. And they found that the bot was doing most of its activity in the last of these categories, the facilitation of discourse. And they said that the teacher bot drew lurkers into conversations. It was the hub of the largest cluster of Twitter activity and was involved in a total of 40%, 41% of all interactions in the EDC MOOC discussion, either by tweeting or being by being mentioned. Um, and it was more effective than the human teachers in bridging different clusters of activity. Uh, participants really liked the teacher bot for the most part. They were very welcoming to it and they were very interested in what it could do and where it stood on the sort of machine human continuum. So this experiment, um, the speculative experiment in automation did not do things that people often talk about automation as doing in, in higher education. It didn't make the MOOC more efficient. It, did, it wasn't intelligent in any meaningful way. Um, it didn't routine, remove routine tasks from the human teachers. It didn't personalize the experience of MOOC learning. Um, it, it ultimately provoked, invited, included, and acknowledged um, it offered also, I think, some insights into what our robot colleagues, as we framed it in our manifesto for teaching online, might be able to do in the future and what we might want them to do. And in this sense, um, I think it was a very uh, good example of a speculative research project or maybe a speculative teaching project or something in between. Um, and some of the kind of key ideas that I want to um, to highlight in relation to the teacher bot and speculation are, first of all, that um, these objects really generate realities and relations in the spaces that they're inhabiting, including in educational settings. Um, glitches and surprises are definitely not incidental when working speculatively. And as I say, I really didn't, I, I you know, I was interested in, in what happened with the um, Twitter bot when it glitched, but I didn't really start thinking about it in a lot of depth for several years after the end of the project. Um, but it's actually, I think now, one of the more important things uh, um, about that project and what happened. Um, unasked questions and unspoken assumptions in future trends like automation of teaching are really often worth exploring in speculative ways to ask those kinds of questions that might not be possible to explore in other ways. Um, but also research ethics really need to be quite central to a speculative project and in an ongoing way so that um, people, it, that the projects can trace and respond to emergent impacts. We couldn't have written in our, um, in our ethical approval form for this project um, about what we would do if the teacher bot, um, you know, created uh, a, a huge noise like it did. Um, but we needed to respond to that and to think about the impact on participants and consider what we were going to do. Um, and that's a kind of, yeah, an, an ongoing engagement with ethics that does come along with working speculatively. OK, so I want to give you three more examples um, of speculative work before I close. Um, the first one is from Andrew Cox from Sheffield, who in 2021 de developed a design fiction that actually um, built on the EDC MOOC bot. He, he imagined a future iteration of that bot whose capabilities were a bit enhanced, but um, whose interactions with students were challenging in various ways, including for students who were less compliant with the vision of a particular course. Um, so this bot he called Critical Bot. Um, and he talked about, uh, and he, he, he presented this dialogue between uh, two students and the critical bot. So student one says, critical bot, we've been set the task to research bias in artificial intelligence and education. What do you know about bias in AI ed? A critical bot says, Blanchard is recommended in the reading list. And student two says, I think he means RTFM. Student one, Blanchard, critical bot. Sorry, I should have just typed Blanchard EG. 2015 sociocultural imbalances in AI ed research, etc. No one's perfect. Critical bot, what's the main point he makes? 
Nice try. Try reading the abstract. Abstracts summarize key points. It may also be useful to read the conclusion section to grasp the author's main argument before deciding on whether to undertake a closer reading. Um, Cox talks about the way this design fiction can embody alternative imaginaries of AI that are focused on really simple technology, uh, but capable of actually engaging in quite high level teaching skills. And he asks, he says, you know, whether and how an AI could actually do this is an open question and a challenge. And I think we're very much starting to see that challenge being taken up as people are engaging with ChatGPT um, and what it is able to do and not able to do um, at, at the, in the current moment. So I think that's an absolutely important point that um, this open question and this challenge about what AIs could actually do in this respect um, is something we can continue to think about and speculate about. Um, the the next small example I want to share here uh, is from a project that uh, Shan Bain, Michael Gallagher and I did uh, just a few months ago. And um, this was a little project that picked up on an earlier piece of work uh, around the near future teaching project. Um, and we took some of the um, underpinning materials from that project and updated them into a series of nine, uh, eight speculative scenarios and accompanying short stories. So I just want to share one of those here. Um, this is one scenario that we called the Universal University, which proposed that climate change, mobility restrictions, and financial pressures have made attendance at campus-based universities unfeasible for most. Distributed online learners make up the majority of the student body globally. The need for a physical campus is diminished, and campus spaces are almost entirely dedicated to research, admin, and local community engagement. New online teaching models ensure that distributed students stay connected and their educational experiences remain rich and experiential. Significant advances in virtual and augmented realities allow for highly immersive distributed educational simulations and for dynamic community building as if you were there. Anyone anywhere can participate in university as new routes to access are mandated, mandated by governments across all continents. In resource rich nations, 90% of people attend university in some form. So um, each of these scenarios uh, sort of stands alone in the context of these futures. And the point is, the, is not that uh, all of them are true. Indeed, some of them probably wouldn't be able to sit together in the same future world. And it's it's not about um, predicting or trying to make a case for a particular one of these futures, but instead to look at the way that current um, thinking about education futures could play out and try to bring those ideas to life in a way that people can work with um, and develop. So as I said, for each of these scenarios, we also wrote a, an accompanying very short fiction. Um, and the tiny short story that goes along with the Universal University is called Don't Forget to Hit Record. Um, it's a, in the form of a forum, forum announcement um, in an online course from Professor Y. Uh, greetings, everyone, and welcome to week five. Yes, it's the moment I know you've all been waiting for, the first week of lab work. I know from my messages that some of you have been having some concerns, and if that's you, don't worry, you're definitely not alone. But everything you've done so far this year has prepared you for this, so I don't want to hear that anyone bails on the first experiment. That includes you, UTC plus 12. Just because you're going early doesn't mean I don't have my eye on you. Now, as you know, we don't believe in making things easy. Just because you're students doesn't mean you can't do, re do real science, and we are training the next global generation of scientists to tackle the big problems we're facing. We're going to start you off this week with one of the most challenging experiments you might ever encounter. You will have support from your lab nets and the TAs in your zones can port in if needed, but it's up to each one of you to make sure you're prepared for this and to complete it within the week. I don't care if you have to start over three times and it has happened. I expect you to get it done. As you'll see in the lab notes, grinding up the reactants and cleaning them in the glove box takes about five hours, so cancel your other plans this week. You might end up spending several days on this if it doesn't go right the first time. If you've upgraded your goggles over the weekend, you should find the guide sims are ready to get you started. And the immersive notes from the last three lectures in, are in there as well. Remember to set your gloves to extra fine because you need to be extremely accurate with the powders. If everything goes well, you're going to learn more about chemical reactivity than you could ever find out from watching or reading. If not, well, there's a few different ways things can explode, but you'll figure it out. Good luck and remember to hit record before you start. We make a blooper reel to show at the end of term bash like we always do. And it's always a lot of fun to revisit this one. Ciao, Professor Y. So we may come back and talk about this one in a minute, but I think 
what this story does that adds to the speculative scenario is give a sense of what it might be like, what it might feel like to inhabit one of these future worlds. Um, and the Universal University, um, obviously, like a lot of other um, kind of future visions, has kind of high level, big picture implications, but it also has implications and things to tell um, about what the day to day experience of living in that world might be like. And this is what um, a lot of speculative work that's happening in education at the moment is trying to grapple with. So um, my last example is from a paper in 2020, uh, Neil Selwyn and colleagues writing about what might the school of 2030 be like an exercise in social science fiction. People may be familiar with this. Um, and I'm just pulling out one of the vignettes that was um, produced in that paper. Um, so this is uh, the day that Oracle didn't know. That's my title for it. I think it's called something else in the paper. Um, and it's a story about uh, the Oracle system, which oops, um, which creates um, uh, bespoke lessons for teachers uh, based on the student data that it has. Um, so given the student data, student data it had, Oracle knew her students better than she did. Every lesson it organized the class into five groups, band one, band two, band three, band four, and band five, and each lesson was structured around five, five interwoven scripts appropriate for their capabilities. When Laura had taken her first job, she had imagined herself planning classes and marking papers late into the night, but actually this was completely not how it was. Oracle took care of most of Laura's planning and assessment. She had become bored with her own classes and her students could sense it. Second bell. Session was one was underway and Laura was still in the teacher's lounge staring at her still buffering device. Grabbing that term set text, Lord of the Flies, she flew out the door and headed toward the classroom. She'll just have to think of something on the spot. I can do it, she told herself. She remembered back to her first year undergraduate English subject, reading as social practice. That's what I'll do, reading circles. Instead of the five capacity bands, students will just have to work in mixed groups. Laura shuddered to think what might happen when the band one kids tried to work with the band fives, but she had little choice. We're supposed to do what, miss? Move the tables? Does Miss Daly know? Actually, forget the tables, Laura replied with an authority that surprised even herself. Push them to the side of the classroom. Today we'll sit on the floor in the reading circles I've allocated you to. A hush fell over the room. The students looked at each other, unsure whether this was a joke. Some looked up to the cameras at the front of the classroom that provided a live stream of their check-in on any lesson at any time. Others looked nervously to the glass fronted hallway where Ms. Daly would often stand peering in during the lesson. Well, get on with it, Laura commanded. I'll leave you to read the rest of that story um, if you are interested in that. The whole paper is really interested, interesting and the scenarios all come from an imagined school um, in the suburbs of Melbourne in 2030. And it's really focused on the sort of mundane and day to day experiences of technology futures. Um, I'm going to stop there with this question, um, which is what futures questions could we be asking about accessibility, ad adaptability and scale? Um, I'd like to know what sorts of questions people are already asking that are about the futures of these things and also things that um, might have occurred to you uh, through this talk or um, in, in general, what kinds of um, what kinds of work do you think would be generative? Um, so that's my question for you, but of, of course you may also have questions for me and it would be lovely to spend the next few minutes just having a little chat. Um, so I'd like to say thank you so much. Uh, this is me and um, you can find me at Jar on Twitter, although I'm trying to move over to Mastodon. Um, I'm not really doing very much of either at the moment, so I'm around, you can find me. Um, and here's my email address as well. And I would really love to um, just hear from you all. Thank you so much.